Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, Kula. How are you? How's everybody? Doing good, thanks. Very good. Very good, Anna. Um, so I see uh, eight people, right, currently uh, in this collaborate. Um, yeah. I know it's quite limited. I mean, I, I always feel the collaborate is quite limited in the sense that, um, uh, first of all, um, the features, um, I can only use, I mean, I can only share my screen, so <laughs> that's the, that's why I can, uh, I wish there were something uh, interactive that I could do, um, not just, you know, uh, more than just, you know, uh, asking questions, you know, and answering. Um, but let me, uh, let me quickly check. Um, so I have and i have yeah okay i have eight people in the discussion board and eight people in the uh, collaborate so same number of people and uh our total um and i wonder if you have uh if you have noticed um because we had our first quiz uh i guess about two weeks ago and uh, not here, not not this one, but uh, the results. Uh, the results were posted in the assignments folder, right at the bottom. Um, so that was already two weeks ago, right? And I wonder if you have. If you have ever checked that, uh, let me also not this one, but where should I go? <clears throat> All right, so it must be here. Uh, Well, let's see, at least on the roster, we have 18 people. Maybe these people, um, and they are still active, right? None of them are, uh, these people who didn't do quiz one, but they are still attending, right? This person attended only once. And we've had, how many, how many classes so far? A very, you know, it wasn't that that much, you know, um, five. And including today, that's going to be six. We still have uh, some, most of the classes are like, you know, halfway through. Especially this one, uh, your class meets only once a week. Um, but um, another class that also meets once a week, is almost like you know uh, past that you know seventh class, so this is sixth, this is seventh, and once you're past the seventh class, seventh session, then you'll have only like uh, you'll have oh still eight eight classes left. Good, you know uh, you guys have plenty of you know uh, time actually. Um, But uh, this person had just one attendance. So that was August 28th. And ever since then, never attended. So most likely this person thinks that he or she has dropped out. But uh, I just want to remind you that um, um, you are never officially uh, withdrawn until you take that action, until you file 
for withdrawal with the uh, registrar uh, and just stop uh, if you you know stopping stopping to attend doesn't automatically uh, uh, take you out of the uh, take you off the uh, list and then you will still remain on the roster so um and out of those you know uh, 18 I have like 10 uh, nine strong. <laughs> nine strong good people uh, now uh, so in our last class we were um, we uh, took a look at a very basic example of uh, cash flow analysis very basic um, and in that it was just a a personal, personal uh, financial uh, uh, cash flow analysis example. Now, we are uh, today. Uh, we'll be looking into. Um, we'll start up. We'll start up with you know. Uh, um, we'll start off. Actually, we'll start off with you know uh, a more uh, complex example, but still personal cash flow. Uh, not for business, but you know, uh, you can think of it also. If you're uh, as a uh, one-person business, if you're self-employed, right? Uh, if you're self-employed, or you know, um, uh, one-person sole proprietorship, right? You own your business; it's a sole proprietorship, but you are the only, <laughs> you're the CEO as well as the janitor, <laughs> right? As well as the uh, um, secretary as well as the intern. Um, uh, I mean, if you're self-employed or you know a sole proprietorship, one person sole proprietorship, it would, this would be a good um, um, this would be a good you know uh, comparison or a good um, good analogy. <laughs> Analogy is not the right word. Okay, so just like the last time, um, but this time, um, uh, Sally Smith. Sally Smith is, you know, uh, selling her old car and buying a new car. Because in, in the last example, it was only Joe uh, just buying a new car. He didn't have a car before, buying a new car. So adding a new asset. But there was a loan, right? So, uh, and we looked into the uh, change in the balance sheet and, you know, looked into the income statement and uh, analyzed the cash flow there in that case. Now, this time, Sally Smith. Sally Smith, um, let's, take her, uh, uh, let's take a look at her income statement. Oops. I wanna let, let's blow this up a little. So uh, she had, um, you know, we are always looking at it at the end of the year. So it's time one, T one, right? Uh, I've been telling you, we need two balance sheets. Uh, Balance it at time zero at the beginning and balance it at time one at the end of the year, right? So during this year, uh, her income was 60K and her expenses were 62K. So obviously, you know, uh, net income, uh, so she spent a lot uh, beyond her means and her net income, her net income was. Um, a negative 2,000, right? Negative 2K. And at the beginning of the year, looking at a balance sheet uh, at T0, she already had 6,000 in the bank. Um, and that's an asset, of course, you know. Um, at the end of the year, uh, it dwindled down to uh, 1,000, right? It was a 5,000 drop in uh, net uh, uh, cash in the uh, bank. Uh, of course, she must have used. Um, uh, she must have used it, and 
she added a luxury car of 2000 right luxury car uh, 2000 is, you know, uh, of course, not a luxury. You cannot buy a luxury car for 2000, but whatever it may be. Um, she acquired a new car, right? Luxury car for 20,000. And she used to have an economy car, right? Um, oh, so uh, she didn't have an economy car at the beginning. Well, she had economy car at the end. So that means what? Uh, she doesn't have this luxury car anymore at the end. So she had a, a luxury car worth 20,000. So that, that must be, you know, uh, um, like depreciated value, right? Um, I mean, the car may be five years old. And at the end of year five, it could be, you know, um, um, the resale value. Uh, uh, resale value was probably 20,000, right? But she had it at the beginning. Uh, she doesn't have it at the end. So the uh, asset decreased by 20K, right? But the, the economy car uh, increased. Uh, there was no economy car at the beginning, but it increased by um, 9,000 because so that's the uh, price that he uh, she paid uh, that's uh, for the economy car so that's the value of the economy car so at the end uh, at the beginning total assets adding up all these numbers 26k at the end of the year adding up these numbers 10k so one thing you have to uh, keep in mind is that uh, at the beginning or at the end, total assets must balance out, but the total liabilities and equity, right? So they balance out. And let's take a look. <clears throat> so her liabilities, her liabilities, in uh, there was a you know, $14,000 liability at the beginning of the year. That $14,000 liability is gone at the end of the year. Uh, so that means it was paid off. It was paid off. Okay. Um, she had that, you know, uh, that liability was a car loan. She had a car loan, outstanding car loan on this luxury car. And by selling that luxury car, she could uh, pay off this car loan. Right, and then uh, at uh, at the end, you know, so there is no more car loan, and her equity was twelve thousand at the beginning, but at the end uh, it is uh, only ten thousand. So two thousand uh, equity reduced by two thousand. Okay. Uh, so we'll we'll figure out where that you know uh, two thousand went. Um, so basically, you know, at the end, so total liabilities plus equity at the beginning, they add up to twenty six thousand. So balanced out, balance sheet is balanced out, um, and at the end, um, uh, the total liabilities and equity is ten k. So it balances out with the uh, balance sheet right at the end so let's take a look at the uh, uh, cash flow statement right or cash flow analysis first of all her cash income 60k and then expenses 62k net source of cash from income uh, uh, negative 2000 and then source of cash from selling old car 20,000 minimum. Use of cash to pay off old car loan, 14K, right? Remember, if you sell asset, uh, if asset decreases, then uh, cash increases, right? Ash, uh, the asset increases, cash decreases, right? Um, so, um, K 
cash increased from sale of old car. Uh, and she used you know, uh, 14,000 of that to pay off the uh, old car loan, right? And she uh, used of cash to new car, 9,000. Well, you know, it's an increase in asset. So cash decreases, right? And the total, if you add them up, it's negative 5,000, right? Just by, you know, simply, uh, that's like 1600, 1600 plus 9,000, so 25k negative, right? 20, negative 25k, so uh, plus 20k, negative 5,000. So, oops, what happened? So, um, now reconciliation, right, uh, of all of this. Um, so uh, beginning cash balance was six uh, six thousand beginning cash balance right six thousand net cash flow negative uh, negative five thousand so ending cash balance one thousand right ending cash balance so that explains that explains why we have ending cash balance of one thousand okay. So this is, you know, uh, 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 a second example, uh, which is a little more, uh, a little more, you know, uh, complex than the uh, first one because in the first one there was, you know, no um, sale of asset. It was a acquisition of asset, but no sale of asset. Uh, so from this, what we can uh, what we can learn from this is that you know, if asset if there is an asset increase, then that's use of cash. You know, cash balance will have to go down because I already told you, right? You used cash in acquisition of asset. If the asset decreases, so you sold the asset, then that's the source of cash. Cash increases. If the liability increases, that's source of cash. You borrowed loan, right? You, you borrowed money, it's loan. A loan is, you know, in a source of cash. If the liability, if the liability decreases, that's use of cash. You pay off the liability using uh, cash, right? So uh, I, I also I must have, you know, uh, explained this. Three sources of cash flow. I explained this before. All businesses are engaged in three types of activities. The first one is operating activity. Second, investing activities. And third, financing activities. And I told you operating activities are well captured in the income statement, right? That's basically income statement is showing you the operating activity. Investing activity and financing activities are well captured in the balance sheet, right? The changes in the line items in the balance sheet is uh, basically, you know, uh, so... Um, of course, from operating activities, you know, uh, it, you sell something, right? You sell the product, merchandise, and cash comes in. It's not always cash, right? Uh, it's some, uh, most of the times, you know, uh, in B2B, it's accounts receivable, right? Promissory notes and accounts receivable. And then uh, investing activities. Firms buys or sells fixed assets that enable it to do business. Long-term purchases enable it to uh, make long-term purchases and uh, sales of uh, financial assets, right? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, buy or sell uh, uh, fixed assets um, and it makes long-term purchases and makes uh, sale of financial assets. It sells financial. So think about it. By selling uh, fixed assets, that source of cash, like you know, uh, um, fixed assets like plant and equi equipment. You know, part of their plant and equipment they can sell. I mean, when they downsize, they will have to sell those things, right? Or uh, if not downsizing. What about the, uh, um, uh, how can they uh, sell uh, fixed assets? 
Um, old, old equipment. Companies generally sell old, old equipment. And there are other companies that uh, buy used equipment. Of course, that's possible, just like, you know, people buying used cars, right? And although it is, you know, uh, used equipment, I mean, it's still, it's still working, has, you know, service life left. And um, companies that cannot um, afford a brand new equipment, uh, they will, uh, and also because of their um, capital constraint, uh, they buy uh, used assets, right? Um, and then um, long-term purchases means, you know, um, of course, you know, uh, plant and equipment, land and building, purchase of acquisition and purchase of uh, plant and equipment, uh, land and building, that's long-term purchase, right? It's investing activity, right? Investing in the uh, uh, assets, investing in fixed assets. And I told you, fixed assets are, uh, and a def definition of asset is, uh, uh, it's assets must have income generating capability. And I told you in that sense is similar to, um, uh, it's similar to uh, physical capital. Yeah, physical capital means physical assets, right? Physical capital means, and the only difference is when we say physical capital, right? Um, it's me, it means means of production, right? Capital means, you know, first of all, means of production. Means of production in modern terms is what? Modern sense, uh, plant and equipment, right? Uh, and then, um, how do you finance this, you know, uh, uh, purchase of, you know, long-term uh, assets. Well, uh, through sale of uh, financial assets, such as, you know, stocks and bonds. You sell stocks and bonds, and uh, uh, with the proceeds, you invest in uh, long-term assets. And then financing activities, uh, it's mainly, you know, borrowing money, uh, pay, off, uh, pay off loans, right? Uh, Borrowing money. Borrowing means, you know, um, of course, long term and short term, all, you know, included. Pay off loans, you know. Uh, if you borrow money, right, that's source of cash. But if you pay off loans, that decreases cash. If you sell stocks, uh, uh, they're the source of cash because, you know, uh, uh, cash comes in, right? Those who, uh, uh, and then pay dividends. If you pay dividends, pay out dividends, cash goes down, available cash goes down. So uh, they call it, you know, uh, this is, uh, there's something called, you know, racetrack diagram. But this diagram, uh, this diagram uh, amply, really, you know, amply uh, it, uh, it captures the, uh, the essence, the cash flow diagram. This is you know, how cash flow, uh, where it comes from, where it goes to, right? So first, in operating activity, uh, how is cash used? Uh, you buy inventory, right? Inventory means, you know, uh, again, we talked about this. Uh, uh, Raw material, I mean, for, for manufacturers, inventory means raw material, goods in process, and finished goods. Uh, and inventory in this case means, you know, for a manufacturer, uh, raw material, right? And then that creates accounts payable, right? You don't, you pay with promissory note. You don't pay with cash right away. Pay with promissory note. And then uh, eventually you will have to uh, honor your um, promissory note, right? So you pay um, you pay cash to vendors, right? That goes up, cash goes up, so that will decrease your cash. Also, you pay wages, pay wages. Uh, wages are usually, you know, uh, represented as accrued wages, accruals, right? Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, it will it will be paid, right? And then. 
using inventory and workers and capital, right? Uh, you produce the merchandise, the product. Product goes out for sale. It creates receivable, accounts receivable, because you know in B two B, in B two B most of most of it is you know a promissory notes. And then uh, uh, cash comes in eventually. You know uh, uh, either uh, when they buy they pay cash or you know pay with you know if it is B two B pay with promissory notes, but eventually promissory notes will be collected, right? And then uh, 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 one thing, uh, uh, if there is interest interest payment, then you have to pay interest, right? Uh, here it is, you know, uh, omitted, but, you know, then you pay, um, use the cash to uh, pay taxes, uh, you know, um, and then cash goes to IRS. In this case, when cash comes in from the uh, customers, then uh, it it goes into you know it, it's a cash inflow, uh, and then that cash will be used. Uh, it will be used first to purchase the fixed assets, right? So this is internally generated, uh, internally generated capital, uh, internally generally generated equity, uh, internally generated. Uh, meaning, you know, uh, not paid in from outside, but, you know, uh, generated uh, through its operating activities. So it goes first to um, um, acquiring, fi purchasing fixed assets, and then uh, that will reduce cash because it goes out to the uh, vendors, right? And also... Also, it is used to pay dividends to the uh, stockholders, right? But if you sell stocks, right, then there is, you know, uh, uh, cash coming in. And with that cash, you know, uh, coming in, you can uh, you use it to buy inventory, right? Uh, working capital, right? Some of it is, you know, uh, from the... Uh, uh, um, paid in capital from the paid in capital from the stockholders, some of it is going to uh, uh, cover for acquisition of fixed assets. But some of it is going to uh, support the operating activity, which is then, you know, called what? Working capital, working capital, right? And then also by selling bond, right? By selling bond, Right. Oh, so here, um, uh, by selling bond, uh, the cash comes in. Right. This will go to again. Uh, some of it will support. Right. Some of it. Some of it will be, be used to uh, acquire uh, fixed assets, and some of it goes to working capital. And uh, from the uh, uh, cash generated from the operating activity, uh, it goes to repay uh, the debt, right? Um, repayment, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> falls into two categories, uh, interest and principal, right? Now, if it is bond, uh, you must remember this from Finance 100. If you sold bonds, bonds are basically, you know, um, uh, bonds are... Um, uh, bonds don't pay uh, principal until maturity, right? Bonds don't pay principal until maturity. Instead, bo what bonds do, you all, you know, from Finance 100, you should know this, uh, you pay only interest until maturity. And at maturity, you pay the last interest and uh, the, the final interest and the, uh, uh, the face value, right? Okay, so that's the case. But you know, um, uh, if it is a uh, loan, right? Loan, uh, it is amortized, right? Yeah, let me use this. Everybody um, should remember what amortization. Uh, uh, 
Ah. Yes. Come on, I have all right. And let's see if this works. Amortize. Right? Remember amortization? Uh, what is amortization? Uh, it's basically, you know, then you're paying back your loan in uh, monthly installments, right? monthly or it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it could be annual, usually. Uh, but in that monthly payment, both principal and interest, both principal and interest are uh, 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 included in the um, uh, that monthly installment. But then uh, you understand uh, in amortization, uh, The proportion of the uh, the proportion of monthly uh, the proportion of uh, principal and interest are all different. Okay. Uh, So that monthly payment is always equal, right? Monthly payment is constant, right? Through and through. But this monthly payment breaks down into interest and principal, repayment of principal, right? Small portion of. principle. And if the monthly uh, payment is, let's say, uh, 3,000, it's always 3,000, right? Until time N. The, the maturity, right? Um, until uh, Or terminal time. Let's let's call it uppercase T. And you remember, uppercase T is the symbol for terminal time. It's always the same. Monthly. Uh, but then um, interest uh, early on. It's mostly interest. Let's say early on. Interest is 2.8K, right? And that means what? Uh, principal is 0.2K, right? And as time goes on, uh, this gets smaller. Interest gets smaller, right? 2.6K, and then this will be, uh, in other words, the composition, the composition of um, uh, interest and principal in that monthly installment uh, is not the same. It gets uh, smaller, uh, the interest gets smaller and smaller. This was 2.7, right? And this should be 2.6. And you get the idea. Right? That's amortization. And think about it. When you uh, borrow money, I mean, so that's, that's the uh, advantage of, that's the advantage of the bond, if you think about it. 
That's the advantage of the bond. Right? That's the advantage of bond. From, uh, from the company's perspective, um, the burden is a lot less. You might wonder why. Isn't it? Uh, the burden is still the same. Uh, anyway, you will have to, uh, uh, at the end, you will have to cough up um, you will have to cough up the. Uh, uh, you'll have to cough up the uh, uh, principal anyway. No, but think about it. Principal can be always refinanced. Principal can be always refinanced, right? Um, suppose a company has sold, you know, uh, ten million dollars. Uh, uh, company has sold bonds for ten million dollars. Right, that's roughly about uh, ten thousand bonds because uh, each bond sells uh, for about one thousand dollars, right? More or less. Um, then you know, let's say it's a ten-year bond. Ten-year bond, you pay, uh, and if the coupon interest rate is ten percent, right? Annually, you know. Uh, uh, the interest will be 100 annually. So for 10 years, then, you know, uh, that's, that's a very, you know, uh, 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 as an investor, you double, uh, I mean, you know, you, you get, you know, 100% return over 10 years. Uh, but until, until year 10, uh, uh, the company pays only interest, so a lot less burden. Right? Then, you know, amortization. Uh, and at the end, uh, in year 10, they can, they don't have to cough up that, you know, uh, 10 million out of their own pocket. All they need to do is they can uh, sell bonds again for $10 million. Right? Sell bonds, right? Uh, Ten million dollars worth of bonds again, and there will be proceeds. With this, ten million dollars come in. Uh, those ten million dollars can be used to pay off the old bondholders, the principal. Uh, so they can simply roll over, right? They can simply roll over, right? This is you know, um, uh, they can simply roll over those ten million dollars, the roll over the principal. This is one thing. Uh, one benefit of bond. I mean, if you get $10 million in a loan, you can't do that. You'll just need to, uh, you'll just have to uh, amortize it. You'll just need to, uh, uh, you'll have to pay, you know, both interest and principal um, uh, little by, uh, by, you know, monthly installments, right? So uh, this diagram captures it very well. I like this diagram because it, it really, you know, uh, captures the essence of operating activity, investing activities, um, financing activities, right? And also, you know, uh, it's also uh, the circulation. That cycle is, you know, also captured in this racetrack diagram. It looks like a racetrack. That's why they call it a racetrack diagram, right? And this is, you know, uh, mostly... Um, it's mostly focused on operating activity, right, uh, as the source of uh, cash. So you have, you know, uh, inventory and labor. Of course, that will be uh, paid for by cash. Cash pays, you know, for raw material. Cash pays for wages. Cash pays wages. And then they produce goods and sell. Sale generates revenue, which is mostly receivable, right? In receivable, uh, or a direct cash, right? And receivable turns into converts into cash. So then the cash then you know uh, uh, funds the inventory purchase and wages, right? And then part of it goes into uh, uh, acquiring assets, right? Paying for tax, paying taxes, and whatever is left is profit, right? Goes to profit. 
So this is focused, this racetrack diagram foc focuses more on operating activity, the cash flow to and from um, operating activity, right? Uh, but this diagram is more uh, quite complete. This diagram is more complete. Okay. So now let's take a look at um, a, a more, you know, um, full-fledged, full-fledged uh, example. Uh, case of Belfry Company. This is real business now. So as I said, we need two balance sheets and one income statement. So this is our income statement here. Uh, this is, these are our balance sheets, time zero, time one, right? At the end of 2021, right? Uh, or 2012, less, uh, 2011, uh, at the end of 2012. And then time one, uh, time two, or time zero, time one. So let's first take a look at the uh, their um, uh, uh, balance sheet, right? So at time zero, there was um, cash balance of in their ass on their asset side, cash balance of one thousand. Now generally, uh, all these numbers are already in thousands, already in thousands. So then. This means it's million, right? All these numbers are generally in, uh, expressed. Uh, just to uh, save some space uh, for, for, you know, these uh, zeros, right? Um, numbers are generally uh, in thousands of dollars. Uh, there is you know, uh, no mention here, but that's the convention. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, $1 million is thousand. One thousand thousand dollars, right? Isn't that right? One million is you know thousand of thousand, right? Uh, anyway, so uh, cash balance at the beginning was one million, but at the end of the year it increased by four hundred k. Accounts receivable was three thousand, uh, but it dropped to. Uh, uh, 2,900, okay, uh, and their inventory uh, was at the beginning uh, 2,000, increased to uh, 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 3,200, okay, 3,200. So that means they have more. I mean, unless this inventory includes also finished goods, uh, it would be considered mostly uh, uh, raw material, right? Raw material. Uh, and usually, you know, increase in raw material inventory, uh, companies generally, uh, it's not a good thing, right? Um, of course, uh, it can be, um, it means, you know, uh, they have production plan, right? So they have, you know, uh, this raw material ready. Yeah, that could be a good sign. But then, you know, um, uh, unless there is a uh, supply chain crunch like these days, if there is a supply chain crunch, you know, it's a headache, right? Um, uh, uh, it's better to have, you know, raw material ready, you know. Um, but unless there's a supply chain crunch, um, usually, you know, uh, uh, they they prefer, they like just-in-time inventory. Just-in-time inventory means, you know, uh, um, the supplier will uh, ship the inventory just in time for your production uh, uh production schedule to start. So that way you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to maintain a warehouse, right? I probably talked about this previously because warehouse, warehouse, uh, there are two types of costs, you know, uh, inventory ordering costs, then 
inventory carrying cost, two types of cost related with inventory. Inventory ordering cost and inventory carry. Inventory ordering is, you know, basically, you know, you have to place order and then, you know, uh, every time you place order, there's transaction cost uh, uh, involved. And then um, uh, there's shipping, right? Uh, every time it has to be shipped, there's shipping. Uh, uh, but uh, and then second is inventory carrying cost. Inventory carrying cost is mainly uh, related to warehousing. Now you have there. There's insurance, obviously. If you have a warehouse, you have to first, you know, um, either rent, lease, lease, rent, or you have to have your own warehouse, right? It costs warehousing cost, and uh, it costs you to warehouse your uh, stock of inventory. Not only that, you know, um, uh, insurance, you have to insure, you know, uh, uh, that's inventory carrying cost. And most companies want to minimize this. They don't want to uh, carry too much inventory um, uh, because there's, you know, inventory carrying, inventory ordering cost. But if they uh, are uh, using just in time inventory, right, then uh, they don't have to incur this. Of course, you know, shipping, uh, it's inevitable. Um, but at least, you know, uh, you can save on inventory carrying cost, right? Uh, so if this is mostly, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, if the inventory... Um, Uh, includes also the finished goods and finished goods should not stay in your plant for long. It should be shipped out to the retailers, right? So uh, this is going to take too much time, you know, to, uh, uh, so I'm not, I'm going to skip that, you know, uh, uh, that analysis, but, you know, uh, uh, also accounts receivable dropping is, you know, it can be good. I mean, mostly it is good because you're collecting, right? Uh, uh, you're collecting cash, you know, uh, uh, quickly, right? But uh, 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 accounts receivable remaining for long, right, without getting collected is a headache, right? Sometimes it could mean, you know, uh, it can turn into a... a unrecoverable, right, uncollectable, uncollectable accounts receivable, right? So that's not a good thing. But also, uh, in the short run, in the short run, accounts receivable can be, uh, be positive. It's a, a positive sign because it means sale. You sold a lot, right? But anyway, um, current assets at the beginning was 6,000, current assets at the end is 75 uh, 7.5 thousand 7.5 k right 7500 so uh, as long as assets increase that's a good thing right it's a positive sign uh now let's take a look at the fixed assets uh gross fixed assets sold plant and equipment 4000 uh at the end 6000 right um, so that means plant and equipment increased. That means, you know, more production capacity. Wow. So this is a good thing. Now, accumulated depreciation, depreciation uh, at the beginning was uh, 1,000, at the end, uh, 1.5K. Although, uh, of course, as time goes on, uh, accumulated depreciation will have to be bigger, right? As time goes on, because, you know, um, the wear and tear, wear and tear of your uh, plant and equipment increases, right? So the uh, uh, depreciation of the uh, asset value will have to um, uh, 
depreciation of your asset value will have to increase. But overall, think about it. Um, this is a net gain, net gain in your fixed assets because um, the increase in net, uh, the net gain is, you know, uh, 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 500, right? Isn't that right? Um, the gain in fixed assets was uh, 2,000 um, and increase in depreciation is only 500. So actually net gain is 1,500, right? So, um, uh, so the net uh, fixed assets is 3,000, right? Net fixed assets, 4,500. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, net gain of 1,500. The total assets at the beginning, 9,000. Total assets at the end, 12,000. Now, take a look at the liabilities. And of course, they must balance out, right? They must balance out. Accounts payable uh, at the beginning was like this, but accounts payable increased like this. So then um, clearly, um, this is source of cash, but you know, uh, uh, if accounts payable increased, source of cash, uh, cash flow increased. Uh, Accruals, right? Um, wages, you know, uh, or you know, accrued taxes uh, decreased, right, uh, by 400. Uh, in terms of you know, uh, uh, cash flow, uh, you have used uh, cash to pay. Uh, so. Use of cash, right? Use of cash uh, increased if the uh, accruals uh, and payables uh, uh, decreased. Anyway, current liabilities, you know, uh, um, at the beginning, 2,000. Current liabilities at the end, 2,500. Uh, so uh, cash flow increased, right? That's for sure, a source of cash. Long-term debt increased. Right, uh, equity increased. They all mean increase in uh, cash flow. Right, total capital. Total capital means only long term assets. Long term, right? So, so that's uh, I mentioned. I believe I talked about this before. Difference between uh, total assets and total capital. Right. Uh, Total capital means only equity and long-term debt. It doesn't include, you know, uh, short-term liabilities. So, um, total capital, uh, yeah, and the total capital increased by 2,500. Uh, uh, that's very clear. And then total liabilities, you add these two numbers, add these numbers, that must be 9,000. Ah, yeah, 9,000, you see that, right? And also uh, uh, 12,000 here. How do I get, uh, let's try this, yeah. Oh, come on, what? Okay. Then now, let's take a look at the, um, um, Take a look at the uh, income statement from sales, right? Uh, sales revenue, right? At ten thousand uh, dollars in sales revenue, CS. Uh, they use this acronym of COGS, but I don't like that. Why? Um, uh, it's unnecessary. They usually use COGS, but you know, uh, it's like. Uh, because it's only of, of is a preposition, cost of goods, uh, goods sold, right? Preposition is not usually, you know, uh, preposition 
is not usually part of the acronym, right? Because United uh, USA is for United States of America. We don't have to put all there. I mean, uh, so should we call U USOA? It's like saying USOA, right? UK, United, okay, the United Kingdom. <laughs> anyway, one, uh, I mean, no uh, preposition. Uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, Bank of America uh, is B B O A. <laughs> they had to, uh, rather than B A. I don't know. Um, maybe some uh, somebody used already B A already. Somebody took B A already, and especially you know. Uh, uh, Maybe Bank of Atlanta, <laughs> Bank of Atlanta, Bank of you know uh, Arkansas, Bank of Alaska. Maybe already took you know BA, uh, but you know. Uh, and so I, you know, whatever you know, um, doesn't matter. You know, you can still. Uh, but I use CGS, cost of goods sold. Okay, a cost of goods sold is you know six thousand, right? Um, so gross margin or gross profit, gross profit is 4,000. Again, I told you gross profit is not uh, a good measure of uh, profit because it's not really profit until you take out uh, the expenses, right? Until you take, take out um, the indirect expenses, right? So uh, CGS is only direct cost. And then in the expenses, of course, this depreciation is included, right? Um, and this number must match uh, this number, depreciation. Uh, where's the depreciation here? Right. Net, net depreciation is you know, uh, 500, right? During this year, the increase in depreciation is only five million. That number must match, right? And the uh, uh, interest. And so uh, after subtracting, um, after subtracting uh, uh, 2,100, 2,100 from this, then you arrive at EBIT or operating profit. Now that's that's the uh, the real uh, profit. I mean, you know, of course, until you get to the net profit, but still, you know, this is where you can. I mean, um, old businesses, right? Um, uh, when you uh, do the fundamental analysis of a business, right? Uh, you don't look at this. You look at this number. Okay. You look at you know EBIT, not this. Because this is the first, first, uh, first occurrence of the word earnings, right? First occurrence of the word earnings, it, right? Earnings. Um, and then from that you pay interest. So uh, then it becomes taxable income or EBT, earnings before taxes, right? And then you pay taxes, end up with the net income of one thousand. Okay. Now time for cash flow analysis, but it's uh, 10.34 now. So we'll take a 10 minute break and reconvene exactly at 10.45, I mean 10.44, 10.45, uh, and then we'll go into uh, uh, the cash flow analysis of Belfry company, okay? All right, reconvene at uh, 10.45.
All right, it's 10.45 and we're back. Um, so now let's take a look at the, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, let's take a look at the uh, uh, cash flow analysis for this company. And when you are looking at, when you are uh, taking uh, the cash flow analysis, when you are making, um, uh, when you are analyzing the cash flow of a company, you have to uh, look at it in three um, uh, in three activities, right? Uh, remember three activities that the companies are engaged in generally: uh, operating activity, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, investing activity and financing activity. So we need to uh, uh, we need to uh, um, look at the cash flow in these three categories of activities, right? First, we look at the cash flow from operating activities. Okay, and maybe, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this. Uh, should there be, I will, okay, how do I, this thing should come up. All right. Um, so first of all, um, from operating activity, the net income, net profit was 1,000, right? Uh, and depreciation is added back in. You, you see, interesting thing is you might, isn't depreciation already, you know, um, uh, the result before net income, I mean, net profit, right? Uh, depreciation was already, you know, subtracted from um, depreciation was part of the expenses. So all the expenses are subtracted from uh, income, right? So wasn't it already subtracted? So we arrived at net income. But why does it, you know, uh, it looks like if it's supposed to um, appear here, isn't it? Uh, why does it appear here again? It appears here again because depreciation is actually cash back. It's actually cash not spent. Cash not spent, actually. Okay? And so you must wonder why. Um, it has all to do with the... Uh, um, so I'm going to have to... Uh, 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 so let me let me use um, where is uh, so in the financial statements um, no this is this is homework right so. It's this one. If you remember from uh, there was a separate there was a separate worksheet. Um, what is this one here? There was a separate worksheet about depreciation, and I I showed uh, we didn't go we didn't go over this in the collaborate, but I believe I uh, went over this in uh, slightly in uh, uh, in the main lecture. Uh, so here's a, uh, um, as a typical example, uh, let me use straight line depreciation. And in straight line depreciation, Um, this one is, you know, kind of <laughs> exaggerated. Uh, suppose we are depreciating the car, but the company car, that's company car, of course, you know, the, uh, because otherwise your personal car uh, uh, doesn't, your personal car doesn't follow this depreciation schedule because your personal car uh, is not a business asset, right? 
But you know, if this is a company car, it's a business asset. It's like a, uh, it's a fixed asset, right? It's like a uh, equipment. Um, but let me use, you know, a uh, salvage value of five hundred dollars, not five thousand. Just delete one zero. Um, the car's purchase cost was 50K. So let's say this is a uh, luxury car. Uh, luxury. <laughs> uh, something like, you know, uh, uh, what would be 50,000? Uh, maybe uh, 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 Cadillac Escalade. Uh, roughly, you know, let's say 50,000. Uh, but salvage value is nothing but scrap metal value. When the uh, if this car is fully depreciated, then it should turn into nothing but scrap metal, right? The assumption of depreciation is um, not only the drop in value, but the drop in value results from wear and tear of the asset. Wear and tear. I suppose if the car wears and tears evenly over its service life. Right, and if the service life is five years, then the um, it will wear and tear evenly over five years, and eventually reduces to scrap metal. Then it is fully depreciated. That means you. Another way of saying that is you use the car to its fullest, to its maximum usage. If you use something to maximum usage, it will turn into. Nothing but scrap metal. For example, your shoes. You have, let's say, you you have your shoes. If you use, if you utilize your shoes to its maximum utility, what should it turn into? It should turn into nothing but a rag, isn't that right? And what kind of value can there be in a rag? Huh? Zero, isn't that right? Uh, and the production equipments too. If they are utilized to its maximum utility, all the production equipments will wear and tear to the point that they turn into nothing but scrap metal. Isn't that right? That's the uh, meaning of depreciation. But is the reality like that? No, the reality isn't like that. Right? Service life of the car is given as five years, but this is already an artificial, this is already artificial, right? Cars don't uh, wear and tear to the maximum, right, in five years. Maybe, you know, even if you use the car, of course, if you use the car very roughly, right, you treat your car very roughly, it can turn into scrap metal even in the first year. But generally, people don't roughen their car, right? Uh, most people, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe not most people, but some people take care of their cars like their baby, right? But if it is not a personal car, a business asset, right? It doesn't belong to you. I mean, it belongs to the company and uh, the company chauffeur, company driver <laughs> will be driving it. Uh, of course, he, he is responsible for taking care of it too, uh, but you know, um, there's no reason to uh, take care of it like uh, his own baby. Um, but um, the point is, uh, cars don't last only five years. Uh, I mean, uh, on on average, even if you do not take care of it like a baby, like your own baby, or even if you don't, uh, uh, you know, roughen it, right? Treat it like a, uh, you know, <laughs> um, uh, the cars in the movies, like, you know, uh, Fast and Furious or <laughs> Mission Impossible. <laughs> the cars are just, you know, uh, uh, or, you know, um, 007. Uh, you know, James Bond's car is Aston Martin. I mean, that's a typical, you know, Aston Martin is a very good car. But, you know, they don't care. They just, it's just an asset, right? <laughs> you, you, you total the car, you crash the car, <laughs> even, you know, uh, and it's, it's been fine-tuned by the, uh, the engineers 
of the MI6. It's been fine-tuned and upgraded with all these, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, weapons, weapons, and you know, uh, uh, special equipment that will make the car become a submarine or become even, uh, uh, you know, a flying machine, and it fires rockets and missiles. It doesn't matter. They they just crash it in the first day on the first day. <laughs> but think about it. You know uh, the value of the uh, added value to that Aston Martin. I mean upgrade, upgraded, uh, added value from the upgrade. That would make the car probably million dollars. But you know they just crash it like. Uh, well, that's that's the. Uh, but you know it is fully depreciated. It served its purpose. That car served its purpose. That car was, you know, uh, uh, like a, a combat platform, right? Like a military Humvee, but it's uh, uh, like a, you know, Aston Martin is like a, uh, <laughs> uh, if it is, it's, it's almost like a Harrier jet, right? Or a Raptor, <laughs> right? Very expensive military equipment. Um, but they crash it on the day on day one, right? But it has served its life. I mean, it has served its uh, purpose. It has served its purpose, right? So then it is fully depreciated. When it is fully depreciated, and it has served its purpose and fully depreciated, then it turns into scrap metal. That's the idea behind uh, the depreciation, right? So as I said. Normally, cars don't turn into scrap metal uh, in five years. I mean, they will last probably 10 years, you know, uh, just average with just even with average maintenance. But in our example, uh, depreciated in five years. Um, so um, annually, 9,900 is depreciated. How did I get that? Of course, no depreciation rate. Uh, each year, one-fifth will be depreciated. That's 20%. And then 20% of what? 45, 45K. 45K. Which is called depreciation base, right? Purchase cost minus average value is called depreciation base. So, uh, I don't know why I used uh, so the depreciation base times the rate, times the depreciation rate, or divided by service life. Right. Will be 9,900 every year. And once I change this, everything changed as well. That's very simple. The annually, 9,900, 9,000. Uh, and accumulated depreciation or cumulative depreciation in the first year is like that. In the second year, right? You just add like this and drag it down. Uh, uh, it will give you accumulated depreciation. Book value, it's always purchase cost minus accumulated depreciation. So if you drag it down every year, it will show the book value at the end of the year. Right, book value at the beginning of the year, uh, book value at time zero was this, isn't it right? Book value at time zero was this, but the book value at time one is this. Book value at time one, which is uh, uh, you know, then uh, book value at time two, book value at time three, book value at time four, book value at time five, and book value at time five, at the end of his service life, must be equal to the salvage value, and it is. It's bound to be equal to, but then think about it. This is, you understand, this is all very artificial because reality isn't like that. Value doesn't, um, this is all artificial. If you have your car, you would know your, your car, resale value of your car doesn't drop evenly like this, right? It drops the most in year one, right? It's a new car, but the minute you drive out, drive it out of the uh, car dealership, right? You haven't even put five miles on it. 
but the resale value drops drastically. In the first year, almost, you know, uh, uh, it drops by like 40%. Um, and then your usage is uneven. So wear and tear is uneven. Wear and tear is uneven year by year. But here, it's almost assumed as if wear and tear is even every year. So what does this mean? This is all artificial construct. Depreciation is an artificial thing. I mean, depreciation of your own car, personal car, it is a, it, it reflects the reality. It's realistic uh, depreciation. And it is in you know, a market, uh, uh, resale market uh, will tell you exactly uh, how much it has depreciated each year. But business asset, depreciation of business asset, follows a completely artificial schedule, completely unartificial schedule. Why? Because it, it is all about matching uh, 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 or spreading the expense over five-year time frame. Why? Think about it. When, when the company bought this car, when the company acquired this car, how do you think they paid? Uh, how uh, how do you think they paid for it? I mean, you know, how do you think the payment is made? Hmm? When uh, there are a couple of uh, two possibilities. One, the company paid upfront. The company paid cash, fifty thousand dollars in cash. Okay, that's option number one. They paid fifty thousand dollars in cash up front or with credit card. But no matter what, um, fifty thousand dollars was actually already expensed in year at in year one at time zero at time zero, right? So then think about it. The company would want to write off this expense in year one. They want to record this as expense in year one. And then think about it. If if it increases the expense, if it increases the expense, then it will decrease the EBIT by as much. They want to write off this expense, this cost, purchase cost of 50K, as the uh, uh, expense that occurred in year one. Expense that incurred that they incurred in year one. Right? Uh, normally, that that's what everybody would think normally because it happened at time zero you would record it in the income statement of year one but then year one uh the ebit will go down by as much as 50k if the ebit goes down by 50k then also that means uh ebt the uh, earnings before taxes the taxable income will go down by 50k as well you understand and then if the taxable income goes by goes down by 50k then taxes go down by as much that that by uh, you know 50k times tax rate by as much as that the taxes will go down so uh, if this this was all you know uh, but think about it uh, that means tax revenue to rs goes down right by that much and if this is something anticipated already something that has been anticipated ahead of time uh iris would not would not have hard time adjusting to this situation but look nobody reports to irs or you know uh ahead of time in advance uh, no business I mean, no, nobody has obligation to report to IRS that they have a, uh, you know, a planned purchase. They have a plan for buying uh, uh, this asset, this equipment in year one, right? N nobody, and even if they report, I mean, <laughs> uh, there is no need to get approval or authorization from IRS. IRS doesn't know whether the company has a plan to acquire assets or not. IRS has no idea. But look, think about it. There are 
millions of company, businesses, millions of businesses, maybe not million, but I don't know, uh, sm including small businesses, millions of businesses in the US. And if all the businesses just, you know, simply wants to write off all these expenses, I mean, they have, they can buy cars, they can buy uh, production equipment, they can buy, they can do anything, right? They can build a plant. I mean, if they write off these expenses in, in the year that, that those expenses were incurred, then it will be a chaos. It will be a real, you know, it will, it will be a hell of a chaos for IRS because I, there is no way of projecting the tax revenue. If the tax revenue projection is not possible, then uh, government, federal government budget is also um, not possible, right? There's no budgeting for anything. So uh, IRS doesn't, uh, IRS wants the companies to, even if this was incurred in year one, if this expense was incurred at time zero, IRS wants the companies to spread it over like five years, right? This is called service life. And the service life is designated by the IRS tax code, right? By, you know, diff, uh, asset, there are asset categories like, you know, uh, uh, three-year, five-year assets, three-year assets, five-year assets, eight-year assets, 10-year assets, 15-year assets, 20-year assets. And there are about five categories. Cars fall into like three to five-year assets. I mean, uh, I'll have to look, but, you know, IRS, um, um, Medical equipments, you know, something like 80-year assets. MRI machines, you know, uh, like 15-year assets or 10-year assets. I don't uh, I'll have to check. But, you know, all assets, depending on what category they are, right, they have service life. And then you have to uh, spread this expense over that service life, designated service life. That way, IRS can... IRS won't have any, you know, unexpected shocks, you know, unexpected, you know, uh, huge, you know, spikes, dips. I mean, if if you if IRS cannot, um, uh, if I, no, nobody, as I said, nobody needs to get authorized by IRS for their own purchase, right? But if they uh, want to write it off in the first year, then there will be a lot of dips and spikes in the uh, actual tax revenue year by year, right? There will be a lot of dips and spikes. And dips and spikes, of course, uh, will make it, you know, uh, impossible for uh, a government budget, right? So um, that's why. I mean, think about it. Um, so depreciation, actually, if this company, if this company actually uh, paid out this $50,000 uh, they paid for the car up front at time zero, then actually um, in from year two, actually these expenses, these depreciation expenses are totally artificial. I mean, this is like uh, not paying out cash, but just making it look like they paid out cash, right? In the income statement, they make it look like they paid out cash. Make sense? So actually it is depreciation is, that's why they call depreciation is non-cash layout. What does that mean, non-cash layout? That means it's a non-cash expense. What does non-cash expense mean? You know, can there be non -cash? Uh, So it is an expense, you know, um, uh, at least, you know, some way, you know, uh, in, uh, if it is non-cash, then it's in kind. In kind means you know, uh, uh, not cash, but in 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 goods or whatever. No, expenses are expenses, but you know, non-cash means non-cash layout means there was no actual. There was no actual cash payout in year two, year three, year four, year five. Okay. Uh, 
So then this is hollow. Hollow expense means actually it's a preservation of cash. You didn't pay out this cash, but um, it is, it was entered in the expenses and subtracted as if it was expense. So actually it was pre cash preserved. So everyone is clear about that. Hmm? This is very important. Everyone is clear about that because um, to understand why depreciation is added back in here, depreciation is added back. Why? Because it's cash preserved, actually. It's cash preserved, right? So everyone is clear about that. I, you know, um, I said to, is it clear I said to? Do you follow? It is. Okay. Anna, Anna, is it clear? Yeah, I'm with you, Professor. Okay, great. Andres, Andres, is it clear? Andres? Ethan, Ethan, is it clear? Um, Understand yes. why? Okay, um, depreciation yes. is, yeah, non, uh, you know, cash preserved, actually. Jamail, Jamail, are you there? Jamail, Jamail, no? Janith, Janith, are you yes, there, Janith? Yes. Yeah, is it, is it clear? It is. Is it clear? Okay, great. Kula, Kula, are you there, Kula? Yeah. Is it clear? Is it clear? Yeah. Okay. Tyra, Tyra, are you there, Tyra? Tyra? Yenchu, Yenchu, are you there, Yenchu? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, great, yeah, great. Thank you. All right, great. So now you understand why depreciation needs to be added back. So this also brings us back to, um, um, to the concept of um, Professor. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sorry, Someone did was you, asking. Uh, hold on, hold on. Did you? Okay, uh, Richard. Yes. Yeah, I was just asking. Go if on. You call on. My my uh, my service is just acting a little weird. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, can you, yeah, and uh, I would appreciate it if you could uh, raise the volume of, of your microphone a little, because you sound very dim. So, uh, Richard, I uh, just want to uh, clarify that with you, too. So, you understand why depreciation is actually cash preserved. Exercise with one rock. Receive your back. Hmm? Hello? Yeah, Richard. I'm sorry, this, this thing is acting weird. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I, All I right. do understand so, the depreciation side of it. Okay, great, great. All righty. So uh, then uh, let's think about, um, I mean, we didn't talk about, we haven't talked about a terminology called, um, I mean, you know, uh, in the income statement, basically, um, in the income statement, uh, we know what is uh, we know what is EBIT is operating profit, but sometimes you will find in the actual income statement you will find something called EBITDA, EBITDA, or EBITDA. What is EBITDA? Hmm? So EBIT is, you know, earnings before interest and taxes. But what is DA then? Depreciation. Yes. And, even and what is A then? Amortization. I don't yeah. know if I'm saying amortization. that right. Yeah, amortization. So EBITDA stands for, uh, er, of course, earnings before interest and taxes and depreciation and amortization. So what's the difference? Well, EBITDA is always supposed to be greater than EBIT. And it's um, depreciation and amortization are uh, sometimes, you know, uh, like two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same coin. Um, but this is because there is more, uh, think about it, this is cash flow, right? You're adding back in cash flow to this. Uh, 
numerically, this is greater than EBIT. Yeah, uh, someone was trying to say something. Hmm? Someone was trying to say something. All right, uh, I guess not. But you know, um, um, this is mo more important, you know, if it, if it is, you know, uh, more important, because that's the profit, that's the profit. If it uh, is uh, sort of, you know, a blown up number, right? Uh, but not really, you know, um, um, uh, uh, it's kind of inflated number. I mean, uh, you can't, you can't uh, assess the, uh, the profitability of the company by EBITDA, solely by EBIT, right? Uh, okay. So here we have, uh, so now net change in current accounts, from the current accounts, you know, the, uh, uh, and if you go back, we can tell, but you know, uh, um, see current account. Uh, uh, in the current account. Um, you don't see, you know, 600 directly, but you know, uh, uh, you can see increase. And then uh, you can see increase of uh, 1500 and uh, increase of 500. Where did that? Um, oh, but the explanation is, you know, clear. Uh, so uh, where did this negative 600 come from? I go to, that was, you know, uh, um, Again, source of cash, use of cash. Uh, use of cash is negative. There was, you know, uh, receivables, increase in receivables of 100. Inventory, decrease of inventory of 1,200. Increase of payables, uh, 600. Accruals, decrease of accruals by 100. So if you add up all these numbers, 600. Um, negative 600, right? Uh, just to check um, accounts receivable. Yeah. Uh, you might say uh, accounts receivable decreased by one th uh, 100. So accounts receivable decreased by 100. So uh, isn't it negative? No, no. Actually, so that source of cash, if accounts receivable decreased by 100, then that means you know uh, uh, cash uh, you so um, uh, you collected collected 100 so that's why accounts receivable went down by 100 so that 100 collected is source of cash cash inflow right cash inflow and the, so um, and then um, and we we can do that one by one you know line uh, line by line you know inventory we can check uh, accounts payable, but you know, uh, 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 just for the sake of our time, you know, uh, 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 we're not going to uh, verify that one by one. Um, but later, after class, you may, you know, uh, in your own time. So obviously, you know, uh, adding up these numbers, right? Uh, you have 900 from uh, operating activity, right? Cash from operating activity. And then cash from investing activities and financing activities. So investing activities, uh, purchase of fixed assets. Um, yeah, fixed assets increased by 2000, 2000. And then because you acquired or purchased fixed assets, the 2000 was 2000 was expensed. In other words, that's cash outflow. And then in financing activities, right? Uh, and uh, let's quickly take a look at the uh, 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 fixed assets, right? Um,
So fixed assets actually looks like it's not 1,000, but 1,500. Why? Oh, uh, from 4,000 to uh, 4,000 to 6,000, right? Uh, fixed assets increased uh, by 2,000. So then that means, you know, uh, cash outflow of 2,000, right? In financing activities, uh, increasing long-term debt was uh, 1,200. That's cash inflow, right? Source of cash. Sale of stock, you know, inflow of cash, right? Dividends paid, outflow, cash outflow. So uh, cash from financing activities, you know, add up these numbers, right? Uh, 1,500. Okay, but that was negative. So we reconcile uh, and uh, equity uh, and cash accounts. Uh, so what happened to the uh, um, cash? Of course, you know, uh, there was net income of 1,000, right? Net income of 1,000 and stock sale um, of 800. I mean, we saw that already, stock sale. Uh, and then dividend was paid out, right? 500. That's in, these are inflow of cash. This is outflow of cash. And then uh, out of all these numbers, right? Uh, total change in equity is 1,300. And we had the beginning cash balance of 1,000, net cash flow of 400. So the net cash flow of 400. Right, ending cash balance. Uh, there was originally um, cash of one thousand, and then uh, there is net cash flow of four hundred. Right. So um, ending cash balance is 1,400, right? And reconciliation of uh, everything. This is the reconciliation of everything. So, um, uh, you know, uh, putting up all that together, right? Cash from operating activities, you know, um, uh, 900. Cash from investing activities, just, you know, cash outflow of 2,000. Financing activities, uh, net cash flow of 1,500, and then uh, in you know uh, uh, cash and equity, right? A beginning uh, cash balance 1,000, uh, net cash flow uh, 400, ending cash balance 1,400. Okay, so basically, you know, uh, this is the uh, uh, the cash flow analysis, right? In each activities, right? Operating activity, uh, investing activity, uh, financing activity, right? And then think about it. If we um, quickly. Uh, So then, you know, uh, um, uh, 2,000, I mean, you know, uh, think about it. Uh, all operating activity, investing activity, financing activities, if you add all these numbers, right, uh, that's uh, cash inflow of 2,400, right, 2,400, and 2,400, and then uh, cash outflow of 2,000. So you end up with for you know, net cash flow of 400. And therefore, it reconciles with our, uh, it reconciles with our uh, cash line item in the balance sheet, cash line item, right? This net cash flow is this net cash flow. And at the end, um, 
uh, at the uh, time T1, you have 1,400 as net cash, uh, cash balance in, right? That's why you have this, okay? All right, so um, now here's, um, so then cash flow uh, is, of course, you know, uh, quite important. It's very important because uh, cash flow is slightly different from net profit, right? Cash flow is different from net profit. Uh, net pro and as you saw, uh, Uh, the reason is, you know, uh, uh, net profit is after paying out all interest, right? Taxes you cannot touch, right? Uh, you pay out uh, net, you arrive at net net profit after paying out uh, interest and taxes from your operating profit. But think about it. Interest is also uh, taxes you can touch, but you know interest is cash flow. Cash flow available to you, although it is earmarked for uh, to to be paid out to the uh, to the creditors or debt holders, uh, but in emergency, in a in a um, real you know uh, emergency. Uh, you can, it's a source of cash that you can use to uh, stave off the emergency, right? Um, also, of, so we need to, uh, uh, there are two types of cash flow. First, operating cash flow and free cash flow. So uh, you can consider operating cash flow like a concept that is, you know, uh, concept that is uh, like a counterpart to, EBIT or operating profit, uh, whereas free cash flow is a concept that is, you know, uh, a counterpart to uh, net profit. Okay, so operating cash flow is literally um, operating cash flow is EBIT minus taxes plus depreciation. Now. Operating cash flow is the cash flow from operating activity. Now, EBIT is the result of the operating activity, isn't that right? EBIT is the uh, uh, outcome of the operating activity. So from the EBIT, if you subtract taxes, right? Uh, sub, you, can't, uh, you can't touch the tax, right? It's not available, uh, it's not something that you can uh, lay your hand on. It has to be taken out. So you have to take out. Uh, so it is kicked out of the uh, uh, cash flow. And then you need to add back in depreciation. I told you why depreciation must be added back in. Therefore, it is called operating cash flow. Operating cash flow. Then a free cash flow, uh, to arrive at free cash flow, then you know what else is the uh, uh, use of cash flow? Investing in operating capital. Investing in operating capital. And what is you know? Um, uh, now think about it. You need to uh, uh, investment in operating capital uh, means. <clears throat> Uh, changing gross, uh, changing gross fixed asset, changing gross fixed asset. Gross fixed asset is basically, you know, um, um, plant and equipment, right? Plant and equipment, and the plant and equipment uh, changes year, you know, uh, every year because it at least it gets depreciated every year. It gets depreciated. The value drops every year, right? That's um, so. If you, um, uh, in our example of the car, right, our company car, uh, you don't have to assume that this is only a car. Let's say this is a $50,000 equipment. Every year, right, uh, book value changes, right? And the change is this. Annual depreciation is the change, right? 
But of course, um, it's not only um, so. Um, if it is negative, right? If it is negative, because you know uh, annual depreciation is uh, negative. But it's not only depreciation. Think about it. Uh, if this is plant, if the plant depreciates by 20% every year, of course, plants service life, plant uh, and equipment service life of uh, uh, plant and equipment would be depending on you know what type of plant it may be. But some it's usually somewhere between 10 to 15 years, 10 to 15 years. Even if it is, even if the service life is 10 years, that means annually uh, you will depreciate by 10 percent that's by the that's the schedule 10 percent schedule but think about it then in five years that means the plant has depreciated by 50 percent it's not only the value of the asset value of the uh, monetary value of the plant right uh, depreciation the reason for depreciation is the wear and tear now think about it yeah, literally, if the plant and equipment wears and tears, it's not only the value that goes down, but what else also goes down? This is your, like, five point, uh, this is uh, 0.5, uh, not five point, but 0.5 point question. Mm -hmm. Today's 0 0.5 point question. Five point question, you know, let's just call it five point. Today's five point question. Anybody? When plant and equipment depreciates by 10% every year, which means, you know, uh, plant and equipment wears and tears by 10% every year, it's not only the value of the plant and equipment that goes down, but also what else goes down? What, go, what else goes down? Anyone? It's not only the value of the plant and equipment that depreciates, but what else goes down? Anyone? Is that the pricing as well? Does it have what? to never mind? No. I said to what did you say? Anyone else? Other than the uh, monetary value of monetary other than the monetary value of the plant and equipment. What about what like, else uh, maintenance and stuff? Upkeeping it? Upkeeping it? Well, actually, upkeeping it will have to go up, don't you think? Because it uh, uh, wear, because of wear and tear, right? Because of wear and tear. I mean, depreciation is not only monetary, if you think about it. Um, uh, Professor. Yeah, depreciation so schedule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Let's go say on. If, it, if it's like an equipment, right? And you're saying it's uh -huh. not only the monetary value, but like, doesn't the production, like how much it produces, if it's an. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, Anna, you hit it right on the head. You hit the nail right on the head. Yes, of course. Production capacity goes down. Think about it. Your plant and equipment is wearing and tearing by 10% every year. Of course, artificial, artificially 10%, but in reality, uh, it could, it's uneven. In, in reality, it will be most likely uneven. Uh, so if your plant and equipment wears and tears by like, you know, uh, 10%, of course, in re, uh, actually unevenly, right? Uh, but if, if they wear and tear by 10%, then the production capacity capacity of your plant goes down by also 10% every year. So five years later, then the production, if you leave it alone, the production capacity will drop by 50%, which means a serious blow to your market share. Isn't that right? Not only, think about it, it's not only market share. First of all, because production capacity is 50%, you know, uh, slashed by half, five years, you know, after time zero. At, so at time T5, production capacity is 50%. That means your plant can produce only 50% output, 50% of the original output. And then you can, your revenue will be then 
because the output is 50%, your sale will be 50%, your revenue will be 50%, also your market share will be 50%. This is a, and if you have a close competitor, you'll be overtaken by the competitor, right? So this is a serious problem, right? So Anna, okay, Anna, um, yeah, you got 0.5. You got 0 0.5. Thanks, You're welcome. So um, nobody, nobody will just watch it go down, hands down, right? Nobody, think about it. If you're the uh, management, will you watch your production capacity go down by 10% every year? Just, you know, uh, standing up, you know, hands down? Hmm? No, there is no management that will just let their production capacity go down like that. Maybe, you know, in the, in the first year, yeah, 10% down. Well, um, uh, you want to uh, shore it up. You want to shore it up, but, you know, let's say in, the, in year one, you're not, you don't have that, you know, capital to, um, but year two, year three, you cannot let it go down like that. You will need to replenish. I mean, if, <laughs> Replenish. I mean, if planting equipment is something that can be replenished, uh, but you know, um, again, yeah, it's just a metaphor. Uh, but what that means is, you will need to rebuild or you know add, I mean, whatever the worn and torn, uh, worn and torn uh, part of your equipment. You will need to replace it with new part and you know, um, uh, so new part and new equipment. Therefore, that's the uh, that explains that explains this part the change in the change in um, uh, gross uh, the change in uh, gross fixed assets. Gross fixed assets goes down by depreciation, but there will be something that will uh, simply replace simply replace the worn and torn part of the uh, fixed assets, right? Uh, or even expand, right? Now, uh, later you will see there are um, uh, uh, three types of, you know, projects. One project is, you know, uh, uh, one type is, you know, uh, 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 replacement. You're replacing old, you know, uh, 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 depreciated or dilapidated uh, uh, fixed assets. Second, so then production capacity will remain uh, constant as before, right? Second type of project is expansion. You want to expand the production capacity. Third type of project is new venture. It's like expansion, but uh, not, uh, you are going into a different type of a business line or in a different type of product or that's called you know, new venture, okay? But you know, because of that, uh, uh, change in gross, uh, gro uh, change in gross, uh, pro uh, gross fixed assets can be positive or negative. And then there will be change in networking capital. Change in networking capital means, you know, uh, uh, networking capital is what? I've been telling you, working capital is another name for, okay, where's my whiteboard? Working capital is another name for current assets. Yeah. Then what is net working capital? Net working capital, net. So it's current assets minus current liabilities. Okay. That's net working capital. So change in this, the delta means change, change in that means change in net working capital. It could be positive or it could be negative. Sometimes you, and mo, uh, of course, most of the times it will have to be positive because current liabilities is what makes any company go bankrupt, right? In other words,
You want to have like more interest. current assets. Hmm? I was going to say, like interest have... payments? Yes, yes. Not only interest payments, but also, um, look, uh, uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, accounts payable, accounts payable, right? Current liabilities, accounts payable. Ah. Accounts payable, ah. notes payable, and then uh, accrued wages. Yeah, interest too. Accrued wages. These things are current liabilities. And that must be funded by current assets. So you must have more current assets than current liabilities. And the rule of thumb is, rule of thumb uh, is this ratio. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, rule of thumb is this ratio, ratio between current assets and current liabilities must be at least two rule of thumb. This is called current ratio. This is called current ratio. Current ratio. And the rule of thumb is it must be at least um, equal or, or to two or greater than two, right? Why? Uh, it, not just not just greater than current liabilities, current as, but if this is just just greater, simple, let's say it's equal. If it is equal, just equal, then you pay all the current liabilities. You stave off, you stave off, you know, um, uh, uh, default, right? But you have no working capital left. You need working capital, right, to uh, per, uh, acquire raw material acquire inventory and, you know, uh, uh, to support the uh, production activity, you know, until uh, revenue is generated. But if, if, so if this number is not greater than two, then uh, uh, you're, you're in a, a bad shape, right? In terms of liquidity, in terms of liquidity, you're in bad shape. Okay. So, um, So that's what networking capital. So this is usually positive number. Or uh, and uh, this could be uh, positive or negative. But whatever, uh, whatever it is, it must be funded. All these changes in and this is sometimes called uh, capex, capital capital expense, capital expense, uh, short for capital expense, capex, right? Capex. Um, just like OPEX. Remember, OPEX is for operating expenses, short for operating expenses. Uh, CAPEX is short for uh, capital expense. Um, oh, we're until uh, 12.15. I, I still thought it were until we run until 12.30. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, we haven't taken the second break, so let let me just uh, keep going and uh, uh, finish by like 12:05 or right. So it must come. Uh, all of this must come from uh, this, which is called operating cash flow. So uh, if you subtract investment in operating capital, uh, which is this, from operating cash flow, which is this. Then that's called uh, free cash flow, free cash flow. And this, this free cash flow is, you know, uh, free cash flow to firm, to the firm. Uh, there is free cash flow to equity holders, but, you know, uh, that's, that's another thing. Uh, that's something, you know, uh, we'll discuss in uh, Finance 300. Um, now, I told you operating cash flow is like the counterpart uh, in, in, in cash flow, uh, it's the counterpart to operating profit, which is EBIT. And then uh, 
free cash flow is like, you know, it's a counterpart to net profit, right? And of course, you know, uh, if free cash flow is negative, that's a very bad thing. It can't even, that means negative. I used, you know, um, uh, you may have noticed this is uh, what I do <laughs> because uh, spelling out everything is a stupid thing because it takes too much time. What do you think this means? Huh? What do you think this means? Hmm? Anybody? Isn't it obvious? That means positive. What do you what do you think this means? Hmm? That means negative, right? Uh, usually, I don't spell it out because either I I would use you know uh, either greater than zero or less than zero, right? I, uh, I guess not. <laughs> Still greater than zero, less than zero, right? I would use you know or I only use symbols, you know I you know. Uh, uh, because, you know, spelling out everything, that's elementary school, right? If you spell out everything, that's really elementary school. Uh, uh, anyway, so then why is cash flow uh, 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 free cash flow uh, later, um, especially in valuation, right? Uh, free cash especially in a stock valuation model, uh, dividend is, you know, it's mostly dividend discount model, but, you know, uh, not because not all the companies pay out dividends, free cash flow is, uh, free cash flow valuation model is uh, crucial. Now, so that, that wraps up everything about the uh, uh, cash flow um, analysis. And eventually, you know, in cash flow analysis, uh, uh, the bottom line, like, you know, uh, uh, EAT, like, uh, or EAT, or net profit, uh, the bottom line of cash flow analysis is free cash flow, okay? Now, so we move on to the ratio analysis. Uh, this is the, uh, actually the pinnacle, uh, the whole conclusion of the fundamental analysis, right? Fundamental analysis is the analysis of the uh, business uh, purely based on only the uh, uh, the uh, financial statements uh, because nothing else, no matter what, everything else is noise. Everything else is noise. In the stock market, there's a lot of noise trading because people people's ears are very thin, right? Uh, people's ears are very thin. You know, they they hear something, they get they 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 move like a herd, right? And this happens. They hear all kinds of you know uh, uh, fake news, and they form their you know uh, uh, they form their opinions based on uh, fake news. That's a very dangerous thing. And in the in the stock market. Also, there are so many, you know, uh, fake news. Um, they, but it's in finance. There's a term that describes it. It's been a, a for you know uh, traditionally that fake news, all that you know, it's called noise. Nothing but noise. Noise is also engineering term, right? Noise is an engineering term. Have you guys ever heard of white noise? What's a white noise? Hmm? You know what white noise is. What's a white noise? No one knows? White noise is like a humming humming noise, humming sound of uh, background noise, humming background noise from like, you know, refrigerator or AC. And they have, they have, uh, relatively consistent, consistent, you know, uh, 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 what's the word? Frequency, consistent frequency, range, consistent range of frequency. 
You understand? White noise is like, you know, um, the noise can be, oops, that was a pen. I could have scratched my screen. Usually, you know, uh, no, uh, sound is uh, like frequency, right? And it, it could be high pitched or low, you know, it could be like this. Frequency could be like that. That is not white noise. That is, you know, um, if you have frequency range like this, uh, that's not white noise. That's clearly, you know, uh, uh, some screech, you know, tires, a screech of, you know, tire or, you know, uh, sharp noise, you know, um, uh, or, you know, uh, dull, dull sound or whatever, you know, um, uh, you know, shattering of glass, you know, uh, so sonic boom, you know, that's all high pitched, you know, um, or, um, or low pitched, you know, I mean, sonic boom is not necessarily high, but it's, you know, like a, like a bass woofer of the base of the woofer it's low frequency but very um so that would be like you know um like this right uh base uh or you know um low frequency you know uh but like woofer you know, or sonic boom would be like that but a uh, high pitched tone uh high pitched sounds have you know uh higher frequency, right? But if the, uh, uh, regardless of, you know, uh, uh, or, higher frequency, this is higher frequency, this is low frequency, but the thing is, if it is constant, if the range is, if the range is, uh, if the range is con constant like this, if the range is constant like this, you see, if the range is constant like this, it's called white noise. And then what white noise is, uh, eventually it, it, it dissipates. In other words, you know, you don't notice it anymore. That, you know, humming noise of air conditioner or humming noise of the, uh, that hum from um, like, uh, refrigerator or air conditioner because their uh, range is constant it just becomes a background noise and you don't you don't notice it you don't notice it right you don't notice it that's called white noise right and in the uh, uh, financial market in the and especially in the stock market, there is a lot of noise, but it's not white noise. You know, I mean, uh, eventually, if you average it, if you average it out, so uh, uh, you see something like this, some pattern of noise like this. Sometimes people, oh, they, um, you know, what's happening? People sell. People sell. Oh. Uh, here at this noise and people buy at this noise you know i mean uh noise is nothing but uh fake news uh, or useless useless or uh the news that has no uh very low uh veracity very no very low veracity understand very low veracity very low uh Truth, right? Very low level truthfulness, level of truthful, truthfulness. Um, but people buy and sell because they have thin ears, right? And in the market, a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of um, oh, I like this. I can move that move that around. A lot of, you know, uh, um, trading in the market is noise trading, okay? Uh, that That's a very stupid thing. Um, but, you know, um, that's the mentality of the, uh, 
I mean, uh, not everyone, not every market participants are cool, rational beings, disciplined, cool, disciplined, rational beings. But uh, a lot of people are average Joes, right? Um, just trading by noise. So um, that's why fundamental analysis is very important. You, you know, you have to go by the fundamentals, uh, not to make that, you know, uh, not to be swayed by the uh, noise trading. Okay. So and then ratio analysis uh, is basically uh, uh, four categories of ratios. I'm not going to, um, uh, five categories actually. Um, um, and there are, these ratios are um, in those five categories. I'm going to give you five categories. Ah. There's a profitability category, liquidity category, asset management category and debt management category and valuation is they call it market value but you know stock value stock valuation category valuation category okay and in each category there are like at least two commonly uh representative ratios uh in profitability category there are like four or five right we'll look into those you know ratios you know one by one first There are um, uh, three, at least three ratios in profitability category. Uh, first one is return on assets and return on capital. Uh, I usually use ROK, ROK, because cap capital, um, the symbol for capital is K, not C, ROK. So I, I uh, normally use ROK. This is the uh, notation from the book, right? From our textbook. So I just, you know, I uh, used this notation, but you know, um, uh, as you can see, uh, capital is K uh, and then return on equity, okay? Return on assets, uh, it's EBIT, over total assets. It's the ratio between the two, EBIT over total assets. Okay? And return on capital is EBIT, which is operating profit, right? Over long term capital only, long term capital. I made it very clear. I made the distinction between asset and capital. You know, I'm teaching all, all three courses in finance. So sometimes, you know, what I I get confused sometimes in what I uh, talk about um, when I teach, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 I mean, what I talk, what I must talk, talk about in finance three, uh, 230, I kind of talk, I talk about it in finance 100 as well. And then I talk about that in, of course, there's an overlap. I talk about it also in finance, you know, 300. There is, there's an overlap. It's inevitable. We're, it's finance. There's an overlap. I mean, uh, even if I'm uh, teaching 300, the students, I have to, uh, I have to uh, remind or recall. I have to recall uh, the memory of students' memory I, uh, from uh, Finance 100. Then I have to uh, go back to that again. So you know, inevitably there is an overlap, right? So this was mentioned, I, I believe, probably in this class or in uh, Finance 100. But you know, the difference between asset, total, uh, asset and capital, total asset and capital, is uh, uh, total, uh, total asset is literally uh, equity plus liabilities. And liabilities means long-term debt and short-term debt, right? Long-term liabilities and current liabilities. But in a uh, capital means capital doesn't mean uh, capital uh, is diff uh, capital doesn't mean uh, short term liabilities. 
capital has nothing to do with short-term uh, uh, debt. Capital is always long-term. So it only means it includes only equity and equity and long-term debt. Therefore, uh, when we say return on capital, then it should be even over long-term capital only, right? And then return on equity literally, uh, EAT, that's EAT, right? Net profit over equity. Now, if you think about it, this, these are called profitability ratios. But also, if you think about it, it is the uh, productivity ratio, productivity, productivity of the assets, productivity of total asset, productivity of the uh, ca total capital, productivity of the equity, right? Productivity is also efficiency. I mean, uh, the highest productivity means efficiency, if the most efficient one. Highest productivity is the most efficient. Isn't that right? It's like gas mileage. Nothing measures, nothing measures. Uh, gas mileage is a, uh, uh, a kind of input to output ratio, output to input ratio. Think about it. Nothing Nothing captures the uh, uh, efficiency or productivity better than the output to input ratio. Output to input ratio, output divided by input, in other words. But think about it. This is what we normally call gas mileage. Isn't that right? And of course, gas mileage is not only for uh, gas. It's not only for fuel economy. Uh, people also use this metaphorically, right? As a, uh, um, uh, what's that, figurative, in a figurative sense. Right? Have you ever used the expression, oh, this, well, this option gives you the best mileage? Or have you, if, if, if you haven't used it, but have you ever heard that expression? Huh? This one gives you the best mileage. I mean, not only in the car, in case of the car, let's say, you know, oh, we have this, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, travel packages. Uh, you you want to travel, uh, you, travel agency, you know, you go, you visit the travel agency and they say, oh, we have these, you know, uh, three different packages, you know, uh, 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 package A, package B, package Z, you know, and they are like this. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, if you want value for money, if you want the most value, value for money, right, that's also output to input ratio, isn't that right? Value for money. What does that mean? You get the you want the most output right most value uh, from the uh, given input right for the uh, for the money right if you want the most value for money this package package C will give you the best mileage best mileage right get the idea right everyone so uh, think about it uh, then output to input ratio which is, you know, in general, called mileage, right? So gas mileage is, you know, exactly like that. How many, how many miles you got for 30 gallons, uh, 20 gallons? How many miles you got for uh, 20 gallons, right? Then you divide the miles covered by 20 gallons, and that will give you gas mileage. And that's why it's called uh, also uh, another reason. That's that's uh, another reason why it's called fuel economy fuel economy isn't that right now in uh so uh think about it return on assets return on capital and return on equity then what does this mean output is the profit and uh, so there are two versions. There are two versions in ROA. One version is 
EA, um, EAT over total assets. Okay. And then another version is, second version is EBIT. <clears throat> over total assets, okay? Return on, uh, uh, it's obvious, um, but general return on capital, you can have two versions, but you know, uh, 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 I'll just, you know, uh, use this version. And return on equity, uh, EAT, which is net profit, right? EAT over uh, equity, and think about it. That means total uh, ROA uh, in ROA, return on assets, total assets is the input. EBIT is the output. And uh, I, uh, as I said, uh, we have, they have two versions, but, uh, uh, for return on assets and return on capital, uh, this is more plaus uh, this is more uh, rational, a more reasonable <laughs> version, right? More, uh, I would say, more appropriate version. But return on equity uh, uh, has the numerator has to be uh, net profit only. Okay, so. Uh, uh, we're already out of time. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I without taking a break, I said I would uh, uh, I would break it up. I would dismiss the class a little uh, early. Uh, so um, we're gonna continue uh, with the rational uh, ratio analysis. I'm sorry, ratio analysis <laughs> ratio uh, next time. Okay. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions? Hmm? All right. If you don't have any uh, uh, further questions, then yeah, I'll uh, call it a day. Have a great weekend, everyone. And uh, uh, see you next uh, Saturday. Okay. Thank Alrighty. you, Professor. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank All you. Right, have a great weekend. Tennis. All righty. Uh, take a, uh, have a good weekend. And... Uh, Alrighty, I'm gonna, uh, so I will stop sharing, stop recording, and sign out.